Hey there, you science enthusiasts and AI learners. Today, we're diving into this mind-blowing idea which is like straight out of a sci-fi movie. And it was inspired entirely by this article that was from Quantum Magazine titled, How Space and Time Could Be a Quantum Error Correcting Code. Now, obviously something like that is gonna get me curious. But get ready to have your mind blown because we are talking about the fundamental fabric of our universe and some seriously cool quantum physics. So let's start with something that you might have heard and then work up from there. Quantum computers. With these futuristic computers apart from classical computers is instead of using bits, which are ones and zeros, they use qubits, which can be one, zero, or a spectrum, anything in between. But even weirder than that, in a sense, they can actually be in both the state one and zero at the same time. It's kind of like being in two places at the same time. It's a superpower that lets us compute in a way no other system has ever been able to compute before. But there's a catch because these qubits are super, super, super sensitive to environmental factors. And the second they interact with anything, like the environment, the air, the people, the room, they're toast. All of those awesome quantum mechanical features disappear. And that's why the reality around us doesn't look quantum by any stretch of the imagination. Everything seems just physical and solid. But for a quantum computer to do a quantum calculations, we need it to stay in that fuzzy, indeterminate, kind of like two places at one time kind of world. But there is a little bit of wiggle room with this problem. When you think about computing something in aggregate, we can actually use a type of computation called quantum error correction to sort of average out over some of the qubits, even if some of them do get impacted by the environment and lose their quantum state. You can think about it like a quantum spell checker that keeps quantum computers on track. So to understand this concept of error correction, let's go through an example. Imagine you're playing the game of telephone where you start with a message, you whisper it to a neighbor, they whisper it to another neighbor, and down the chain the message goes. Because of small differences in how people hear things, perceive things, and repeat things, by the time it gets to the end of the chain, obviously the message is nothing like it was at the beginning. And that's similar to how both quantum and regular information as it gets transferred around the internet can sometimes change over time in ways that we don't want it to. But you can make the message longer in a specific way to actually make it more accurate also. Imagine you come up with a rule where you duplicate each word twice. So if the message has the word cat in it, you would actually say the word cat cat and then the other person would use the second one for verification. If a single letter was corrupt and something came through that said Kaz Cat, like C-A-Z and then C-A-T, the other person could probably guess that you mean cat twice, not Kaz twice. So conceptually, if you take that sort of way of sort of duplicating things, double checking things, work that into the message, but you do it in a much more abstract and mathematical way with different probabilistic algorithms and repetitive patterns, you can often ensure that the correct exact message comes through at the other end, but it just takes more work, more time, and more decoding. And even in classical computers where things are stored as ones and zeros, there's often some amount of error that happens. Either heat will accidentally flip one of the ones to a zero, sometimes magnetic interference, or all sorts of just bad code that's out there and compiles in weird ways. Our scientists have come a long way making classical computers much more stable because of the many layers of error correction that are on top of that really basic fundamental one and zero that's running your entire desktop, laptop, phone, Phone, whatever it is right now. So error correction code is like a secret formula that adds extra information to your message but ensures that it comes through correctly in the long run. So now let's add a quantum twist. Because in the world of quantum computing, we're dealing with qubits, not regular bits. And there's literally no metaphor that I can use to help you and me truly understand what it's like to be quantum in nature. We see nothing like that. We've experienced nothing like that in the real world. Or should I say in the real macro world, because this is happening on such tiny scales. Because if you zoom in far enough, every particle in our body is following quantum mechanics. But at this scale, the environment makes them collapse and entangle with their neighbors in a way that makes the world seem the way it does to us. So a quantum error correction code to keep that quantum message in the quantum world has to be built in a very special way. They have to keep the qubit acting in a quantum way, at least on average and on aggregate when we go to measure it. And it has to be done in a really delicate way because you want to leave the qubits as untouched as possible. Any interaction with them, including measuring them, is something that can make them interact with their environment and then not act quantum. So just understand some really smart people are able to do that to some degree, but here is where things get absolutely nutty. Some scientists are thinking that what we experience as space-time might be what it feels like to be inside a quantum computer, that the 
thing all around us, this universe, this environment, is stable because of something like quantum error correction code making it feel stable to us. A significant development occurred in 2014 when some smart scientists were looking at the way the fabric of the universe sort of acts in a really weird averaged out, solid but uncertain at each individual moment kind of way and asked themselves, is it possible that this works in the same way that the error correction code that we're building for quantum computers works and found that it actually might, which would be wild. Physicists Ahmed Alaharmri, Zaidong, and Daniel Haro suggested that maybe the holographic nature of space-time resembles quantum computing code? This would be technically something called anti-de Sitter space. And I wanna break down that term anti-de Sitter space because that means it's a universe that has its own special rules that make its shape. In our case for anti-de Sitter space, you need to imagine something like a horse's saddle or maybe the shape of a Pringles chip because it's curving away from us in two different directions. That's anti-de Sitter space. And although the jury is still kind of out, could be infinite, could be flat, it does seem like that's a real possibility for the universe that we live in. But incredibly, having a universe that has that weird saddle shape actually makes a lot of calculations way more simple. In fact, in the article, it's described as a handy model for physicists to explore quantum physics. But if you take this easier to calculate shape and you think about it as a result of quantum error correction code, it gives us a new tool, a new perspective, a new model to actually think about what the universe is made of and how it works. But there's one reason why we have to lend a little bit of extra credibility to this idea instead of just thinking of it as one in any type of shape or description of the universe. Universe, and that's that it provides some fresh insight and makes some correct predictions about how black holes would work. So this idea and their work is sparking considerable interest in people who work in quantum gravity and becomes this fascinating way that we can use the interplay between what we're learning in the field of quantum error correction with what we know and what we're learning about the fundamental nature of reality itself. Also in the paper, they were describing the universe as sort of a holographic universe. Let me just dive in on that one for a minute too, because I kind of skipped over it. So if if you sort of take the perspective that the universe is made from this quantum error correction, thinking about it in terms of a holographic universe also continues to make sense. Sometimes people talk about the universe that way anyways, but in this case, it actually is more descriptive than usual. Like that way overused thing about the universe where there's like a big trampoline and depending on like how heavy things are, like the sun's a bowling ball and earth's like a baseball and they make that sort of dent. And even though that's only like bending in two dimensions, you could actually think about it like a full three dimensional thing where it's like warping and pulling and things like that. So you can take that model, but then zoom into it in your mind and go in so close to the way that the trampoline is bending that you're actually looking at the individual fabrics that make up the trampoline itself. And now imagine that the trampoline's surface, even though it would be in three dimensions technically, is woven from these tiny little vibrating strings. It's not a material that's static. It's something that's active at the tiniest levels. Incredibly tiny vibrating strings, kind of a string theory type imagery, okay? But actually they're tiny little bits of the universe on the quantum scale interacting with one another behind the scenes and what emerges as like a fiber that could be making up the bigger trampoline would actually be the error correction code that kind of smooths out over it on average. And then just like in some incredibly gigantic unfathomably gigantic game of telephone. There's this huge amount of quantum error correction going on to keep everything stable, giving it certain rules that feel like the fundamental laws of our physics. Okay, cool idea, but how do you test it? So the idea of having no individual like particle or thing or atom or quantized, meaning like actual physical thing that is in a position, then moving outwards and finding that things actually are at physical positions is why we call it a hologram, a holographic universe. Holograms seem like they have dimensions. When you look at them, you seem like you can go forward and back into them, but they're all being generated from just two dimensional information. And in that bigger two dimensional piece of film, there is some information on what's behind the object or to the side of it that you normally wouldn't see on a two dimensional image so when it's projected out into 3d you can see more like going around it but really you're seeing extra two-dimensional information in a way that's perceived as three-dimensional to you and in the same way that error correction code might be causing us to feel these other dimensions that we exist in and it has to emerge from this network of entangled quantum information that's being averaged over with error correction, like a giant cosmic web where it's all being connected. So there you have it. In a nutshell, the world we live in, the reality we experience, the space 
space that we fly our spaceships in might just be quantum error correction code. There's something for you to chew on while you're falling asleep tonight, like I have for the last few days. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so when I find out who wrote that quantum error correction code that makes up our reality, you're the first to know. Plus that helps me get to my next goal, 10,000 subscribers. That would be a dream come true. Thanks for watching.